Steve Piotz, the author of The Complete Guide to Mead Making, joins me to discuss big meads. This is Beersmith Podcast number 150. This is Beersmith Podcast number 150, and it's early June 2017. This week, Steve Piotz joins me to discuss mead making and working with fruits and juices. Thank you to this week's sponsors, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. They're running an amazing deal right now. Get 20% off your subscription when you use the code BEERSMITH2017. Every issue of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine is packed with articles for beer brewers and beer lovers. And you can read my new column, which is called Ask the Experts. Take advantage of their special deal now when you use the offer code BEERSMITH2017 at BEERANDBREWING.COM. Again, that's BEERANDBREWING.COM. And also the new BrewVision thermometer from Blickman Engineering. This interactive wireless digital thermometer connects right to your iPhone or iPad and lets you remotely monitor and record temperatures. You can download your recipes right from the Beersmith cloud and send updates and alerts as you brew. Get the BrewVision Bluetooth thermometer today. Another great innovation from BlickmanEngineering.com. And finally, Beersmith Mobile, the mobile version of Beersmith, is a perfect complement to our desktop brewing software. It includes all the tools you need to create recipes on the go, share them with friends, and act as a pocket brew timer. Check out Beersmith Mobile at beersmith.com slash mobile or on the Google Play, iTunes, or Amazon app stores. And now let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, I welcome Steve Piotz. Steve is the author of the book, The Complete Guide to Mead Making, and was the 2008 Mead Maker of the Year. He's also a longtime mead maker and a mead judge. Steve, it is uh, fantastic to have you on the show. Thanks for being here. You're welcome. Glad to be here. So uh, this is your first time on the show, uh, but I understand you've been making mead for a long time. How, how long have you been into mead? Oh, boy. Sometime in the 90s. I'm not sure when exactly, I guess. <laughs> Lost track. Lost track of your mead making, yeah. And uh, you, you also became a, uh, a mead judge at some point, right? Uh, actually, I've never taken the test. I wrote most of the questions on the test, though. <laughs> you, <laughs> you wrote, so you, well, you grandfathered in as a founding member? or uh, I don't think there's any such thing like that. But no. I, I set up all the BJCP exams, so I kind of know what's in them. And, and actually, I was the almost the only author of the online uh, entrance exam for the meat exam that we put in place, I guess, a year and a half ago, something like that. Awesome. Well, uh, and of course, you were 2008 uh, Mead Maker of the Year, which is fantastic. So, Yep. Uh, okay, well, I was hoping you could walk us through some of the techniques uh, used in modern mead making, uh, which, you know, of course, gives us a chance to make mead in months instead of years. I've actually been making quite a bit of mead myself lately. Um, All right. So let's start with, uh, you know, the no boil method, which seems to be popular these days. Uh, I think most people have moved away from boiling. Can you walk us through that? Sure. In fact, I don't know anybody currently making meat that I'm familiar with that boils anything. Uh, So the technique is you start with basically good water. I mean, mead making in my perspective is not as sensitive to the water chemistry as beer making is mm-hmm. i guess that's that's a good thing you don't want chlorine in, or chloramines in the water but other than that your average tap water works pretty good uh i find since honey is highly messy to measure and i typically buy my honey in like a five gallon bucket or something like that i approximate within an ounce or five or six, the amount of honey I want to get into my fermenter and then add the water to hit the target original gravity just because that makes life a little bit easier than trying to exactly measure the honey out. After that, stir it up, add your initial shot of nutrients and pitch your yeast. Mm -hmm. So there's really not a lot to it from that perspective. You don't need a big kettle. You do need a large fermenter with the the staggered nutrients and the stirring everybody does these days, you can easily generate three or four gallons of foam during the first couple stirring. So you got to plan ahead to make sure your fermenter is large enough. I think most people ferment in buckets now, right? Because it's yeah, just easier to manage. Are, 
Yeah, buckets or something like something like that. I have a couple of those plastic fermenters that look like a big nylon garbage can with a loose lid that work great. A lot of people, uh, uh, you know, one of the big differences between making mead and, and, and beer is you're, you're, you're actually in the mead almost every day or sometimes several yeah. times a day, right? Yeah, it should be several times a day. I find I probably get to it only once a day on average rather than the, the two or three times that would be great. Mm-hmm. Um, well, next, let's talk about uh, yeast hydration, which uh, ends up being really important for high gravity meads because you can uh, you know, actually run into things like osmotic shock and so on that can uh, uh, damage your yeast before you even get it going, right? Right. Uh, I, I think most mead makers are using a, uh, a dehydrated yeast to make their, their meads. Uh, you know, there are some liquid yeast choices out there, but I think there's a bigger selection in the in the dry form and so you really do need to rehydrate your yeast properly so you avoid the shock i mean your the average meat is pretty high gravity in comparison to beer and it can be pretty devastating to the yeast population so i've been using the go firm protect uh rehydration nutrient excuse me (coughs) to uh to rehydrate my yeast typically around 104 degrees fahrenheit or whatever the recommended temperature is by your by the yeast vendor but that's a, a real common temperature from some of the firms like mm-hmm. lalaman so, so you start by uh, mixing in the go firm first right right about one and a half times the weight of the yeast and you know the yeast packets are almost always uh, indicating how many grams of, of uh, dry yeast are in the package mm-hmm. So going from that, rehydrate somewhere in the 15 to 30 minutes. <laughs> Excuse me, dry throat today from all the allergy uh, pollen in the okay, air. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so you're rehydrating 15 to 30 minutes to allow the yeast to get ready to, to do their thing. Generally, they don't recommend going longer than the half hour level because you're starting to lose out and you know having negative effects go too long. And but course, it's a pretty simple, yeah, pretty go ahead. simple process. Uh, you know, I I stir it up. Get the the goat firm protect tends to be a a little uh, difficult to get dissolved initially. Let us say it tends to like to clump up, so you have to stir pretty vigorously to get it all dissolved in the warm water. Mm-hmm. And then uh, you do slowly reduce the temperature too, right? Well, you should. I mean, that's that's the you know the textbook technique no more than 10 degrees centigrade you know temperature shock ever and i do do that occasionally particularly if i if i'm making up a melomel where the fruit came out of the freezer and went into the you know the must mixture that tends to get the must down really cold at that point but i find i tend to be lazier if i'm making something simple that doesn't have frozen ingredients in it so the the mixed mead is around room temperature i tend to just stir up the yeast at the end of rehydration and dump it in it's a little more than the recommended temperature shock but i've been doing it for a long time and getting away with it but technically it's it's not the proper solution Right. So, I mean, basically you mix in your honey or your, your fruit, whatever you're working with, you, uh, you go through this, uh, this hydration process, right? Right. And then, um, um, the next thing, at least I do is I actually typically aerate, uh, the, the must, but what, what, what would you recommend? Well, aerating is, is one option. I find I haven't been doing that for the last few years in part because I'm putting one of the, uh, Basically, the wine aeration or deaeration, decarbonation, whatever you want to call it, degassing wands into my electric drill and stirring the bejesus out of the must to get the honey mixed in to the point where I have inches of foam on the top of the mead by the time I'm through doing the mixing. So I figure I've aerated the, the must pretty significantly at that point. So I just pitched the yeast right in. Mm-hmm. And what are your thoughts on aerating with, with oxygen, which of course does give it, you know, it gets it from say eight to, you know, nine, 10, 11, 12 parts per million. Uh, I do use oxygen a lot when I'm making beer. So I do have the cylinder available. I, and if I wasn't stirring so vigorously, I would still use it in my meads. I used to use it 
And I've just found that with the aggressive stirring that I'm doing, it really didn't seem to change anything. So I quit doing it. Mm -hmm. But I think if you didn't have such an aggressive stir, maybe that wouldn't you know be something you should skip. And I mean, do you aerate again at 12 hours? I know uh, Chris White has recommended uh, for very high gravity, you know, musts or wines and stuff that, that it's not a bad idea to aerate a second time at 12 hours. It would be a good idea. I would agree with Chris on that one. I, again, if if I was being diligent all the time, I, you know, I would be stirring my must at least every 12 hours. And sometimes I get, I actually do accomplish that, you know, at the 12 hour interval or approximately there and then i start slowing down on my stirring to maybe once a day after that so the vigorous stirring again i'm thinking i i'm getting a lot of aeration just from the aggressive stir i'm doing i i i've had times where i've actually had to let up on my stirring because of the foam generated and so i'll let it settle and then stir some more but i tend to really aggressively whip it mm-hmm and then, of course, uh, the staggered yeast nutrient additions have been a significant breakthrough uh, the last yep. few years. Um, uh, what What do you recommend for staggered yeast uh, nutrients? Uh, well, I I would I in my current regime I do a quarter on initial pitch, and then I do a, a quarter each of the next. Uh, well, I do it on day two, day four, and day six. I guess it works out to us. So until I've used it all up, the the wine philosophy behind that would have said that you do the last dosage when you're, you know, you know what, 30%, 25%, something like that from final gravity. And I've just gotten to the point of doing it on a two-day interval no matter what. And it's pretty close to that right time anyway. So, I'm sorry, are you doing it one? Would you say day one, day two, day four, day six? I'm, do, I'm doing it initially, then day, then two days later, then two more days and two more days, whatever that works out to be. Okay. Every other day. And uh, what kind of nutrients do you use? Uh, I know I, there's a variety I'm, here. I'm still on the the older technique only because I bought significant quantities of the stuff and I haven't used it up. So I'm still using both DAP and Fermade K. I have I have not switched over to the newer regime using Fermade o only because I still have like over a pound of Fermade K to use up. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, are you using a mix of DAP and yes, di- using, diamo- di- diamonium phosphate? And, yeah, uh, diamonium and phosphate is two parts diamonium phosphate and one part uh, for made K by weight. Mm-hmm. It's- and, and what are your thoughts on the new, I, th- I think it's like TONSA2 is the, if you, if you Google that, T-O-N-S-A-2 yep. uh, is the current uh, it, yeah, <laughs> current, the, current the, fad, the current, if you will, in, in, yeah, in, in meat and, making. And and then all of these techniques are really only approximations for people like us who don't have the high end lab equipment that actually could measure the precise amount of free ammonia or free nitrogen, I'm sorry, that would be in the must and have good lab understanding of the exact need of their yeast strain. So even the Tansa 2 talks about, you know, what's it, low, medium and high nutrient demand yeast, which you know they're not all you know that well defined and right. you don't none of none of us know exactly how much nitrogen we're getting out of the fruit if we're, or even perhaps from spices if we're making methylens uh so i i tend to adjust down a little bit in my nutrient additions if i'm putting a lot of fruit in just on the assumption that the fruit has some some food value in there for the yeast of its own Mm-hmm. But not necessarily enough to complete the job. And that was but a question. That was a question I had for you too. I, I think the latest Tonsa two. If you look at the very bottom of the website, it's got a little footnote saying, you know, cut the nutrients in half if you're working with a large amount of fruit. But yeah, you know, I'm not sure if that's accurate or. Yeah, or, and I, it probably depends a lot on what kind of fruit you're using, and you know that obviously fruit has uh, you know a. A variation from when it was harvested and where it was grown and all those kind of things just like every other food stuff and so like i said if you don't have the high-end lab equipment that would be required it's it's always just an approximation and mm. it seems to work quite well so i'm not going to complain yeah it uh you know it makes nice meat and actually at a fairly short amount of time i mean how, yes, how long it, is it, how long are you going now for uh you know say an average meat 
Well, I, I have one that I just pitched the yeast, what, uh, Sunday for a hydromel that I'm hoping to serve at the panel during NHC coming up next month. So I gave myself maybe five weeks to get that one done. Wow, that's pretty quick. I, 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 I'm averaging more like two or three months for the thing to fully clean up, you know, Yeah, yeah and especially I, with the big I, fruit meads. Yeah, well, this isn't as big. This, this is only a, a 1080 approximate uh, hydromel but it's still that's it it'll be a little aggressive to get it totally clear okay and then uh next we come to degassing uh i was wondering if you could talk about degassing and or aerating well they're they're kind of go hand in hand the way i do it i have one of the the big wands it's uh, you know stainless steel shaft with the little flip out plastic paddles that i chuck into my electric drill and a variable speed drill I find works a lot better than than a single speed or even my I have a cordless that has a few steps but not nearly as nice as the plug-in one really has true variability and sometimes it's nice to be able to let off on the speed a little bit as you're building up foam but I really do stir it pretty aggressively you get a pretty good vortex even forming in the fermenter if you aren't careful and didn't leave yourself enough room you may make a real mess even even if you aren't in a carboy, you know, you talk to the people that have tried this technique in a carboy, it's it's really can be messy. They make those little stirring ones such that they will go through the opening in a carboy, but I just would be terrified of the mess I would make if I tried that. It'd be all over the ceiling, I'm afraid. Yeah, I've been working it, with, uh, I think it's like an eight and a half gallon bucket, and that seems to work well. Those, even the seven gallon bucket is kind of marginal for, yes, uh, for a five gallon batch. Yeah, I've had like, six gallons of pie mint in these uh, 10 gallon fermenters and you can easily get it right to the rim of the thing and i think they're conservative and they're 10 i think it actually holds more like 11 point something but it you can really build up a lot of foam early on it doesn't last long i mean meads tend not to have good foam uh, retention uh, yeah. retention like a beer does but still yeah. it's there for a little while and it is sticky Yes, it is. It's a, it's a sticky mess. It can be, especially if it starts spraying all over your uh, room. Um, I want to get your thoughts on the following. Uh, some people have actually differentiated between aeration, which is trying to add oxygen to the must, and, and degassing, right? Right. And uh, um, some people argue that, particularly with large fruit meads, that, that you may not want to add a huge amount of oxygen because, of course, the fruits are are susceptible to uh, to oxygenation and, and, yep. and oxidation. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, one of the things I do with my melomels, many of my melomels anyway, is I put the fruit in a, a large mesh bag. I think they're they're you know the big heavy duty ones they they use for amongst other things like brew in a bag. And just because the fruit's kind of in the way when I'm stirring, I do tend to remove the bag of fruit from the fermenter, put it in another sanitized bucket while I'm doing the stirring, and then put it back in later just because you can't stir with the thing in the way. And I find right. stirring with the fruit floating loose in the fermenter, you tend to pulverize it really too much, I think, and then it becomes impossible to rack off it later on. So I just get it out of the way. Uh, it is a concern about ox uh, oxygen, you know, affecting the fruit. You know, if you if you notice the color of your mead turning more orange and brown versus, you know, the the color the fruit started out with, then you surely are getting too much oxygen in there on the fruit, and that's a bad thing. Uh, I don't worry as much about it early in the fermentation because I figure the yeast is going to scavenge in it much more rapidly than the fruit's going to oxidize. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been, uh, for at least for the big fruit ones, what I've been doing is, uh, uh, you know, I oxygenate at the beginning with oxygen, right? Mm -hmm. But when I stir it, I try not to, uh, uh, you know, push a lot of oxygen into it. I just try and get the gas, tr basically try and degas yeah. it. I don't know. Well, um, I, you know, like, you know, I'm obviously degassing pretty heavily, and I think you do pick up a fair amount of oxygen along the way. Right. Uh, uh, I have not noticed 
an oxygen degradation of the meads that I've made. And I do pay attention to things like the color changing, you know, as, as the, as the fruit oxidizes. And I know what, what that looks like from winemaking or from judging other people's meads. Sure. So I, I, I try to avoid the negative things, but I haven't seen it really be an issue with the, the first couple of weeks of fermentation. Cause usually by the time I'm two weeks in, the fruit's long gone out of the fermenter because mm -hmm. you know, you're really pretty much done with primary fermentation by then anyway. Yeah. I usually pull the fruit bag out after, you know, a little more than a week or as soon as it gets down to the last, you know, little bit of gravity if you will yep and i agree working I bet, with the bag is great you know yeah i've even uh, done the the goofy thing of, of then put that bag of fruit into another mead yeah and you don't get any sugar to speak of from that second use of it but you still get some subtle flavors from hmm. that fruit i found it worked really good with black currants in particular it just yeah, kind of became a, a secondary fruit in the the second time you used it yeah, they're very, uh, very acidic and very tannic, too. Um, yeah. Which brings me to my next question, actually. I know you like working with fruits um, um, to make, you know, melomels, piments, those kinds of things. Um, what kinds of fruits do you think work best in, in meads? I think to a large extent, the the acidic fruits seem to work well. Uh Strong flavors work well. Uh, strawberries, while well, I've done them, and you know, and I've had some really interesting ones that others have made. Strawberries are relatively delicate fruit, and I don't perceive strawberries having a high acid content, so it's really hard to get it to come out. When you look at currants, black currants in particular, they're an intense flavor and really pretty acidic, and so they tend to lay a really good base for the mead. Uh, other fruits that work really good are in that, you know, high acidic thing like raspberries, uh, blackberries, raspberries, blackberries. Those yeah. All those are, you know, they have, they have different acid profiles, but they all seem to work pretty good at that. Uh, another one that is low in acid that doesn't tend to work well for people making meads. It has been done, but it, it's much harder to pull off is watermelon because there's, it really doesn't have any anything but water and a little bit of color not even much yeah. sugar in it. i've noticed the pulp a lot of the pulpy fruits are difficult to work with even even some of the stone fruits like peaches are very difficult to get a lot of the flavor to come through yeah yeah i think the last peach mead i i made i you know probably had um in, in upwards of 40 pounds of peaches in it which tends to be a little uh, inconvenient to work with yeah, I think apricots work just a little bit better. They still give you the peach flavor, but uh, but none of them come through the way that, uh, like you said, the acidic, the highly tannic, highly acidic fruits seem to yeah. seem to really come through and work well in combinations too, right? Yeah, and I think they also help make it easier to achieve a reasonable uh, balance of the resultant mead because you're getting some acid and some tannins both, and it's really hard to balance a meat in my, from my perspective with only acid or with only tannin. But they, uh, they do provide the structure though, right? Uh, yep. because the problem is if you, you know, let's say you work with a sweet fruit like peaches, right? Um, you've got a sweet, sweet peaches offset by sweet honey and it really doesn't have a lot of, you know, structure to it. No, it's pretty, it's pretty one dimensional then. Yep. Well, uh, of course, working with fruit can be a big challenge. Um, what tips do you have for working with whole fruit, uh, purees, juices, uh, wine bases, all the different variants here? Uh, okay, where to start on this? One of the things I've noticed with some of the purees that are available, and not, not necessarily all of them, but I've noticed, for example, with some of the stone fruit purees that I've used in the past, that I get sort of that dominant character of unripe fruit from them. And I suspect that's simply an artifact of the kind of fruit that goes into making those things. They're, you know, it doesn't take a whole lot of unripe uh, peach material in a bunch of ripe peaches or, you know, ripe apricots with a handful of unripe ones to get that unripe character and so I find for some of those kind of fruits, I get a much better character by using whole fruit that I've purchased myself and make sure that every part that I use 
is truly right, but that's a lot more work. Uh, yeah. The pre is, you know, is nearly instant gratification in the sense of you open the package and pour it in. And yeah, it, the, it's the, normally aseptic and you're ready to go. The challenges I've had with those, though, is um, um, also getting the, a lot of the debris out. They don't, you know, yeah. they're not as easy. Uh, you mentioned bagging the whole fruit, which yeah, is a great way that. to control it. Yeah, you can't really you can't do, do it. can't do that with the pre. I once made a, an, I think I made an apricot. Yeah, it was an apricot wine using a, a large container of, of apricot puree. I think I, I purchased a 42-pound Mylar bag apricot puree. And I had like, I don't know, 25, 30 pounds in this carboy of, of uh, wine. And in the end, I lost like a third of the batch because I couldn't get it off that sediment. I, I needed an industrial size centrifuge that you could put a carboy in. Yeah, that would work great, right? Yeah, kind of a scary device, but yeah. Yeah, I have a hard time separating those out. Um, I've actually had some better luck using, uh, they sell, uh, I think it's like Vintners makes a wine base. Um, yep. And it's got a little bit more whole fruit in it. You can actually bag it and separate it, and it's not yep. quite as bad as the purees. Yep. But um, but yeah, that's a challenge. Uh, whole fruit, of course, you recommend bagging, right? Yep, I, it there's a, a few that you can get away with not doing that, but most of them you find they're going to turn into a lot of mess when it comes racking time, and they just plug up your racking cane. They they're just a mess to work with. So how do you and, prepare the whole fruit before you before you bag it and put it in the mead? So if I and I almost always freeze the fruit, even if I'm you know ready to make the mead nearly right away just because it helps break down the cellular structure. And it doesn't do anything mm -hmm. for sanitation. It was a sad misconception many people seem to have is that right. freezing sanitizes it. No. But uh, I, so I'll, I'll just uh, freeze the fruit in, you know, freezer Ziploc type bags. If I'm going to leave it in for any period of time, I usually uh, spray the fruit with a concentrated sulfite solution. It helps avoid oxidation of the fruit in the freezer freezer burn so to speak right and so when i get ready to use it i defrost the fruit and dump it into the fermenter uh i've been known to dump it in when it's only partially defrosted which tends to get mm -hmm. the must temperature a little bit low for pitching yeast but and of course you bag it at that point too right yeah yeah, yeah. i still dump it into a bag uh like a bruna bag yeah mesh. yeah yep as big as you need to get the job done uh and at times that can be a really big bag because I've some of, some of my melomels have had forty plus pounds of fruit in them and five to six <laughs> gallon heats. So that so it gets to be a real pain to work with some of those. Uh, for wines, I've had really good uh, success using uh, wine juice unconcentrated uh, through a connection we have locally. One of the guys has been bringing in. In refrigerated trucks, uh, fresh pressed juice from California every fall, of a, a variety of of wine grapes, and in fact now it's even expanded to be you know picking up the spring harvest coming out of South America, and so you you can buy a bucket of this juice. It's, it's been pressed. It's ready to go. I mean, it for 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 red wine piments, you don't you're not getting the skins. They've sort of been processed to give the color and character to the juice that's so not quite the same as fermenting wine with skins on it but right. uh, it works pretty well for making piments in my experience and you don't need a mesh bag it's just ready to go you can put a hydrometer in the bucket of juice see what you got know know how much honey or water you need to mix in to hit your target it's simple to work with and i think a lot of the wine kits are in the same same mode you know the the grape wines yeah i've actually made a fair number of wine kits recently and the the higher end wine kits do have uh you know high quality grape juice that's of the appropriate style and so on the problem yeah. is the the lower end wine kits the cheaper ones generally have like a generic grape juice in them and then you know flavor pack or something like that yeah. so yeah and that it gets that's a, it gets a little same thing right i mean it gets a little expensive but i mean if you buy a high-end wine kit of the right type you will get pretty good grape juice out of it you know yes you will yeah the other one i've tried um and i wanted you to get your thoughts on this i've, I've tried playing with uh knutson's just juice or uh, for example i know there's other other brand i think lakeland there's a few other brands that make yeah uh, i 
just I've a sort a of a pure of juice. And, and, and I mean, again, it's not cheap, but, uh, but it lets you get, you know, stuff that you might not have, you know, like black currants that you might not have locally available or be in season. Right. And I've, I've had good success using uh, pomegranate juice that way. Uh, in, when it's in season, the price mm-hmm. tends to drop. Uh, there are a number of providers out there that in season you can buy concentrated juice from where they're, they're using a vacuum concentration process and it's going to be a four or eight to one reduction juice. And that tends to work out really well as, as for making meads. I, again, you don't have to deal with fruit pulp. Uh, I know you can get those cherry, blueberry, raspberry, blackberry, pomegranate, all in, in those forms. And, you know, if you buy a quart jar and it's an eight to one concentration, that's eight gallon equivalent of, I mean, I'm sorry, two gallon, eight quart equivalent of juice, which is a lot of fruit. And it's really easy to work with. Right. Yeah. That's why uh, people that are looking to make their first fruit mead, that's what I actually ju- usually recommend to them is try yeah. to try the fruit juice because it's just a really easy way to get started, you know? Yeah. And, you know, obviously those kind of juices are not as easily found for some of the more exotic fruits, unfortunately. But, you know, the, the common ones are widely available. Right. Right. Um, I found that targeting the uh, final gravity can be very important for achieving the right balance, particularly in a, in a fruit, uh, big fruit mead. Um, and that as you, you know, as the acidity and tannins go up, you really have to have a higher finishing gravity. How do you yes. go about determining, uh, sort of the right target, uh, for final gravity, uh, for some uh, of these fruit meads? It, it, some of it is just by trial and error. I, if you haven't used the fruit before, it is a little difficult, uh, you're right that a lot of these fruits, since they have a huge amount of, of acid and or tannin in there, you, knew, you do need to have a pretty good residual sugar level to balance them out. I, I think the most aggressive one I've made is there's a fruit called uh, choke berry, not choke cherry, but it's a, a similar character. It's planted frequently as a landscape bush. It had very low water content, dark little purple berries, really high in tan. And I asked one of the longtime wine judges I know about how, because he loves to judge that category. I said, well, how do you get those things to balance out? He says, time. So you got you to gotta wait for the tannins to drop out. Well, I've made uh, melomels with those. And to get a decent presentation in a couple of years, because – the tannins don't drop very fast. I've had the final gravity, I think, was 1060 on that mead. Wow. That's so huge. much tannin. And so, I mean, that's, that means make, you're starting in the almost 1070 or something like that, right? Uh, 1170, probably. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 1170, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's huge. And and it's an awesome mead. People, you know, obviously it's strong. And, and people taste it and they just can't believe that it's that there's that much residual sugar in there. But if, if you dry it out, it's just not palatable. Yeah, I mean, just to put put the numbers in perspective here, a you know a a high gravity sweet mead, you know, a sort so called sack mead might be what ten high ten thirties or ten forty, yeah. right? Yeah, something and so, like that. So when we talk about a mead with a finishing gravity of ten sixty, we're talking about something that would be almost completely undrinkable if it was a straight mead, right? Yep, it would it would be like sugar water. Right. It would be just way too much. But um, but a lot of these melomels, I mean, I, I've been finishing in the in the, you know, 10 high 10 30s, 10 40s even uh, for yep. some of them. Right. Yep. Yeah. You, you that's not unusual. You, you're putting in a lot of tannin and and you've got a lot of structure you know, behind the scenes that you've got to offset. And your your choice is to is you know, to leave sugar in. And it's really the only way. And, and you can, of course, back sweeten afterwards i prefer if i you know if i've used the stuff before i know what it's going to do then i would prefer to have the fermentation have everything there and just have the sugar left over at the end of fermentation i think that ends up with a smoother mead than back sweetening yeah i mean we can um, maybe walk through us just in a second about the, the the process for back sweetening just so folks know if you end up with a a mead that yeah you, know, you maybe you missed it and it's a little bit too 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 bitter or too tannic or whatever 
Um, you can go through this process of back sweetening, but my experience is, um, you know, the back sweetened meats tend to be a little more one dimensional and that you get a lot more flavor complexity in if you can, you know, put the fruit in and, and keep it, keep it all the way through the process. Right. Right. It, 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 there's the benefit of being around the yeast makes a big difference to lots of things. Right. Right. Um, well, why don't, why don't we walk through really quickly uh, the the back sweetening process just for folks that may not be familiar with that because it is commonly used. Um. Okay, sure. Uh, so back sweetening, you know, the first part you have to worry about there is, is this mead stable? Is it going to restart fermentation if I do anything to it? Typically, you're back sweetening a mead that fermented out. It may not have reached the alcohol tolerance level of the yeast yet. So if you add more sugar in there just by adding honey or sugar, it's going to start fermenting. So what you typically have to do is you have to make sure it can't do that. I mean, one way around that, you know, if you're home brewing and you're going to keg it and you're going to keep it in your keyser or whatever – You can just sweeten it because you can be fairly confident you're keeping it at 38 degrees. It's probably not going to start fermenting again. But if you're not going to do something like that, you have to stabilize it. So what you want to do to stabilize it, you want to add some sulfite to it first. And the sulfite has a couple advantages. It kind of helps knock out a bunch of the microorganisms, which can do nasty things with the, the next step you're going to do. It doesn't really... Uh, hinder the yeast per se that's already there. You've you've probably got a large population of yeast. Uh, you, you hopefully aren't stabilizing the meat until it's relatively clear, just because yeah. it gets in your way anyway. If you leave all the yeast in, but you're still even if the meat looks clear, there's a lot of cells of yeast in there. But you sulfide it to the you know the nominal levels, which I don't remember the value, but uh, it's in my book and, you know, it's on all the, you know, the typical, uh, websites. You, you usually use a few Camden tablets and you're, you're there, get that dissolved within a day or so. You can then do the next more important step, which is add the potassium, uh, sorbate, right? Sorbate is the one that keeps renewed fermentation from happening. It prevents the yeast from budding. And, and, and you typically don't add sorbates to a regular meat. It's not uncommon no. to add sulfites, right? But you typically right. don't so, add sorbates. Sulfite has a couple benefits to a regular meat. It's an antioxidant, so it's going to help the meat last longer. It won't oxidize you know, after package. So that that's the reason you would add sulfites. Uh, most fermented beverages tend to have some natural level of sulfite, but you know, you're going to go above that sometimes just for preservation purposes. But in this case, you added the sulfite, then you added the sorbate. <clears throat> the sulfite was put in there, amongst other reasons, to stifle the other microorganisms. Because the bad thing that happens is, um, is some of the lactic acid bacteria mm-hmm. can react poorly, from, uh, from your point of view as a mead maker, in the presence of sorbate. So if there are lactic acid bacteria that start reproducing in your meat after sorbate has been added, they make this really yucky cut germanium flower kind of stem, just a disgusting aroma and flavor in your meat. And once you've experienced that, you want to make sure you never do it again. It's just not a pleasant thing. And there's really no recovery for that process. If you've ever judged the meat or cider, and encountered that in a competition, you know what I'm talking about. So the, the key, the key is they had the sulfites first, yep, right. right? Right. The sulfites first. If you just sorbate, you may luck out. Maybe there weren't any lactic acid bacteria. You only need a few cells, and they, you know, reproduce slowly, and bad things can happen. Maybe you consume the meat in time. Uh, if I'm going through all this work to back sweeten, I want to make sure that that can't happen. So I sulfate, then I sorbate. Then I add the sweetener. So at that point, you can be safe. It's not going to turn into, you know, uh, bottle bombs if you're bottling. It's not going to restart fermentation, whatever, if you've got it Mm -hmm. kegged. 
And so you can add a fermentable, either sugar, just regular table sugar, honey, fruit juice, whatever way you want to back sweeten the mead. You're now stable and it'll work and it won't do bad things to you. And the back sweetening, of course, gets the sweetness level, residual sweetness level back up to where you want it to be to right. have a, have a balanced so, mead. Yeah. Right. So what you want to do at that point, if you're back sweetening, is you want to do a little bit at a time. And, you know, so you don't go overboard because if you put too much in, you've now stifled the fermentation. So it's not going to restart. So it's really going to hard to to remove that extra sweetness you put in there. It's the only thing you can do is blend it with another batch. Right, right. Um, okay. Uh, well, let's go on another topic. One one of the things I was found, found was interesting when I started making a lot of mead is um, the refractometer doesn't often work when we get up into the 11 well into the 1100s have you seen this uh this effect well yeah most of them don't go that high and neither do most of the hydrometers unfortunately (laughs) so when you're making that really monster mead you kind of go huh and I well, really not only like that, that. I, I found that when, even if I got an accurate refractometer reading to start with, when I started adjusting it for, for the alcohol during fermentation, the equations didn't work out, and I got bad yeah. numbers out of that, too. Yeah, the curve fit was done at the low end of the scale, I'm afraid, on yeah. most of those things. So I had yeah. to go back to using a hydrometer for everything, basically. Yeah, I, I do have, I have one hydrometer that somewhere or the other i picked that up over the years that reads as high as 1170 on the on the hydrometer most of the ones i've seen only go to about 1130 which mm-hmm. is borderline for a big sack meat 1170 works out pretty good and probably probably quite low for a for a melamel you know big uh, yeah. big fruit yeah. mead right yeah i don't make too many that are bigger than 1170 but it that's right in that range yeah um, are you are you adding all the fruit in the primary too? That was another yes, question because a lot of people, you know, go, oh yeah, I added in the secondary, and you know, yeah, I, uh, you know, ev- pretty much everybody I know as mead makers, at least locally, and that I've talked to around the world, are doing it fruit and primary. I think you hear IPA makers, for example, now talking about biotransformation of you know some of the hop essences by exposure to these. I think the same thing happens with the fruit. I don't think I could tell you what the reactions are, but my experience with the fruit is it tastes better in the end. It's more melded in if the fruit's in there during primary rather than added at the end. The other negative of adding it at the end, you think you have a nice stable mead. And if you again, if you haven't fermented out to the alcohol tolerance level of your yeast, which is 14 or whatever percent probably, and you add fruit to what you thought was a nice stable mead, you're adding water, you're adding sugar, and you're adding some other flavor substances, you've probably diluted the mead down to the point where if the yeast isn't at its alcohol level, it's going to start fermenting again. And so now you're going to have to go through the process of clarifying it and all those things again, and that just sounds like a bad step making yeah, life. The other problem I ran into, one of the one of the early ones I made where I put a lot of fruit in the secondary, it just diluted the mead to the point where it's completely off balance again now. Yeah. Yeah. So now you gotta bad. go through all that balance work again. And I had I had to back sweeten it, which I didn't want to do and and uh yep. yeah. Um okay, are you using seventy one B uh Narbonne yeast on yours? I, I know that's the most, most popular, common. yeah. That's my mo- my common go to yeast. It has a couple nice things about it. It's cheap. And, you know, a, a big mead, you need a number of packages of yeast to do it. One isn't enough. I yet like to use Mr. Malty's calculator, and I just assume it's an ale. And, you know, you do the calculation. You know, if you're making a sack strength mead, you need quite a few packages of yeast. Uh, it's not expensive, and it has an additional advantage for uh, melomel makers in particular, it uh, has this property that w- it will metabolize some of the citric acid in the must and convert it into malic acid. A lot of fruits are higher in citric acid. And to humans, malic acid is perceived as a softer acid than citric. And so it seems smoother. It's still, it's still acid, but it, it just comes across as a smoother product. It come, it, to me, it seems more like ripe fruit. Right. And, and um, 
One of the other reasons I like 71B is it's got sort of a predictable end to it. It ends at about, yes. you know, 15 and a little bit percent alcohol, yeah. which is, which, you know, we talked about the importance of hitting those final gravities. You really got to have something that's predictable. Yeah. You know, you got to be able to go, okay, I'm going to start at this original gravity so I can hit my final gravity, right? Yeah. And, and using <clears throat> one yeast or a handful of yeast all the time allows you to get comfortable with it like that, that you know what it's going to do. You know that if I give it, a must of 1150, it's going to come out at, you know, the level I want. Whereas if you're constantly switching yeasts around, you probably don't have that knowledge base as to what it's going to do for you in your environment. Uh, I do tend to use uh, assorted wine yeasts when I'm making piments. In particular, if I'm making a Chardonnay piment, I find I get much better results you know, results that I like the flavor of, let us say, if I use a true Chardonnay yeast. Mm -hmm. And and in that case, I actually leave it on the lees as would tr traditionally be done with a, a Chardonnay fermentation because that gives it some of the character. But I found that in those kind of cases, using the yeast strain that's normal for the variety of grape that I'm using is, is one of the times I deviate from a 71B. And I also use ale. Uh, typically, I'm using an ale yeast, just a, a beer yeast for making braggots. Um, okay. Uh, do you have any advice on clarifying and finishing a mead? I find most of the time super clear is the, you know, the two-part uh, clarifying agent works best for me. It usually works 24 hours at worst, it's usually a couple days. It, it works really fast, almost always. Occasionally, I have had one that's been, you know, a pain. You know, you might have a pectic haze, and that, you know, pectic enzyme is your friend in that one. Uh, yeah, you use. I assume you're using pectic enzyme to help break down some of the fruits. Yep. Yeah. I. I. I don't always put it in, and it's surprising. Many times I don't end up with a pectic case anyway, which is kind of surprising. I, you want to consider the, the huge volumes of fruits I'm using, but that seems to be the way it goes. Uh, but you can put it in all, all the time if you, you're so inclined. There's no real major negative from using pectic enzymes in your meat all the time. Right. It it If I don't get clarification with super clear you know i i've i've played with a few other products very infrequently you know sparkloid and a few of the others that i use so seldomly that i don't really feel comfortable using them i do have a filter which i almost never use on on uh meads it's been years since i've had to use that on a mead i i found that that was really a good way to plug up the filter in a in short order yeah, time time works well too. Obviously, yeah. yeah, yes, it works very well. Or you know, throwing it in the fridge for a day or two also accelerates things pretty significantly. Okay, Steve. Well, I think we've covered quite a bit of ground. Uh, do you have any other advice for somebody looking to get into mead making? Well, you can. You know, one of the things about mead making, you know, it's it's all ratios of honey and fruit. So you can you can start out with small batches. You don't have to make you know, five gallon, 10 gallon, whatever batches. And if you have a really pricey honey you want to experiment with, uh, you can make a small batch. One of the the things I would counsel people on, I see a lot of new mead makers asking, and they want to wait right away start out with the most expensive ingredients and the most expensive exotic, you know, this or that or the other fruit honey and it, it can and be I, can be quite expensive to make mead it, yeah it can be quite expensive and you know my suggestion is well perfect your process with wildflower honey or whatever's local to you and once you feel you've got your process down then start playing with the expensive ingredients because you could spend a lot of money buying new zealand honey and having it shipped halfway around the world honey is heavy it doesn't ship well in that regard yeah, fruits are also uh, quite can can get yes. quite expensive at times too, especially yeah, when they're out I, of season. Yeah, I yeah. I, interestingly enough, I spend a few months down in Florida in the in the winter time, and you know, you see a lot more fruits growing down there that you know you just don't ever find locally in my part of the world. And it's a kind of an interesting thing is you know the fruits that are local 
are different depending on where you live. And try and work with what's local if you can. I mean, meat, meat is, is an easy product to make, in my opinion, and can be ready quickly. But use what's local if you can. I mean, you find no matter almost no matter where you live, there's some good stuff you can use. And Steve, uh, I wanted to take a moment here at the end to mention uh, your book, of course, uh, The Complete Guide to Making Mead. Uh, ingredients, equipment, processes, recipes, and so on, uh, available from Amazon. Uh, 2014 yep. book, right? Yep. Came out in August of 2014. So uh, one of the more recent books on making mead. Uh, so I'll, I'll push that as well. Um, and, and Steve, I want to thank you uh, personally for, for coming on the show. Really appreciate you being here. You're welcome. It was great fun. So again, my uh, guest today was Steve Piotz. He was the 2008 Mead Maker of the Year. Uh, he's a mead judge and author of the book, uh, The Complete Guide to Mead Making. Thank you, Steve. You're welcome. Well, a big thank you to Steve Piotz for joining me this week. Thanks also to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Every issue is packed with great information for homebrewers and craft beer fans. Take advantage of their fantastic sale and get 20% off when you use the offer code BEERSMITH2017 at beerandbrewing.com. And also Blickman Engineering, creators of the innovative new BrewVision wireless thermometer. Remotely monitor your brewing system from your iPhone or iPad, record data, send alerts, and grab recipes directly from the Beersmith Cloud. The BrewVision Thermometer, another great innovation from BlickmanEngineering.com. And finally, Beersmith Mobile. The mobile version of Beersmith is a perfect complement to our desktop brewing software. Check out Beersmith Mobile at Beersmith.com mobile or on Google Play, iTunes, or the Amazon App Store. Thank you for listening, and I hope you have a great brewing week. Mm-hmm.